Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. On today's show, we have Solveig Busler of Schnick Snack Systems. Um, even though her favorite color is pink, Solveig loves all colors of the visible spectrum. That's right, we're talking about light. As a member of the executive board at the German-led LED manufacturer Schnick Snack Systems, GmbH, she provides TV studios, rental and production companies, as well as architectural products with LED modules and luminaires as well as control systems. 20 years in the lighting game and entertainment industry have made her an experienced and knowledgeable partner for ideas and projects of all sizes. But before we get to her, Greg, we got to go to griplocksystems.com. That's G-R-I-P-L-O-C-K-S-Y-S-T-E-M-S.com, Greg Eric. Griplock Systems. Look at- yeah, and looking at some of the things that uh, Schnick Snack does, I believe they're going to need some of this stuff because this is uh, meant to hang any type of light fixture. They're a leader, leader in cable suspension for the lighting industry for over 30 years. State-of-the-art components, that's architectural, industrial, lighting applications, labor saving install, fast install, saves the contractors money, tool-free adjustability, mm-hmm. they have in-house engineers. And I'm telling you, I use their product and only their product and have been for the 15 years that I've been in Lighting Plus. Don't use chain. Use theirs to hang your lights. Yeah, make sure your Good lights block. are level by using, uh, you know, aerial cable to and put the level on there. The chain, when you're trying to stretch that chain, the fixture is going like this, and you're trying to get it right. What are you doing, buddy? Get the Griplock <laughs> Systems going. Go to griplocksystems.com. And, of course, Greg, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Come on, man. Join us. If you're a distributor, what are you talking about? The things where this is the, I mean, what did Jeff Snafus say the other day? This association is on fire right now and we are powerful and we're moving and we're making a difference. So if you're in Canada, United States and you're a lighting distributor, join us. That's right. For right now though, Solveig, welcome to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. It's our pleasure. Um, Greg, you know, the idea of color is emerging, you know, you know, in a way we're leaving energy efficiency behind us, Greg, we're leaving, uh-huh. um, they were getting the bean counters out of the, out of the lighting industry. We're, um, we, you know, we talked about circadian, we talked about tuning and all this sort of stuff, but I really think the magic of color, and I'm going to throw it over to you to start this off. I think the magic of color is really where this industry should go. Yeah. And I think that's where we're going and, and kind of, we've talked about in other podcasts is the entertainment aspect of lighting. We're kind of starting to do that in the everyday applications with what LED can do, mm-hmm. uh, which we're going to talk about. But I see the first question is, is that a lead in there? Does it say, can you measure light quality? Is that what you want us to ask? <laughs> right behind you? <laughs> Let's start with that. Can you measure light quality? Why is that behind you? It is behind me because um, as an LED manufacturer, we are not only uh, producing colors, but also um have a more um, intense um, responsibility since lighting um, is not only to make things bright, but also has um, a communicative part. And this is where we come uh, into the game. Um, Since LED is more flexible and more individual than like generic lighting, the, the task is uh, so much more versatile. And therefore, um, there's also the question, how can you combine these two communication and lighting with a function and also with a high quality? Because that's what generic lighting has as an advantage according to uh, or compared to LED. So the question always is, how can you combine light quality in the way we need it? Um, and the options of color mixing and colors with LEDs. So when you say communication, yeah. you talked about communication. What is it that you're referring to? Are you talking about uh, Li-Fi? Are you talking about some kind of nudging um, of people to do certain things, um, using light signaling them in some way? What do you mean by communication? Imagine the lobby of a um, company or of a hotel 
And um, during the evening, there will be different lighting and uh, different scenes than during the day. While there is business opening hours, but in, in the evening, maybe there might be a reception. So the light in the, in the lobby could be very different. And you can achieve this with one type of fixture, with one installation, if the architect is very creative. Um, or the lighting designer is very creative. Um, you can use one installation for the entire um, variances of a variety of uh, uh, sceneries. So this is at this point, lighting has or, or light can have a communicative um, approach. So light also they they go ahead. Also, also for sites, for example, so you can dress your building up in white or depending on the daylight, the circadian um, influence on buildings so that you uh, illuminate your building according to the daylight and the uh, light uh, color temperature that is uh, outside. But also uh, during pride days, you can uh, illuminate your, uh, your building just with the rainbow um, or during 4th of July uh, with blue and white and red. Um, so then there's communication, but uh, on other occasions, there is um, just illumination with the same you, equipment. You, yeah, so you're talking quality to some degree, but also there's lighting controls involved in getting all of this done, isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what? what why would LED in general can can be somewhat controlled, right? But why does quality LED lighting matter? Or in this application, why are you saying more quality than just lighting in general if the control is doing the work that you want it to do? Can you repeat the question? I don't understand that question either, Greg Garrick. I thought you were a professional, um, buddy. Yeah, no, it, I, I think maybe I'm saying it wrong, but we're talking about quality lighting mm -hmm. and LED lighting in general just has the ability to be controlled why does the quality aspect of it matter more because what you're talking about with this is to me i'm just hearing controls like oh i can do it this at this time and that at this time but why does the quality of it matter mm. okay um if you imagine an uh, rgb led mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. any type of it um then the mixture of it if you would like to create something white for example um a warm white it is just the mixture of the red, green, and blue LEDs, and depending on where they are specified in their wavelength, and also the preciseness and the um, characteristics of these LEDs, the lighting curve and the um, spectrum would be lame, maybe, or of low quality. So a lot of CR, um, a lot of products that have RGB mixture um, have a CRI of around 40 only when they create white light. But uh, if you add some um, features, for example, a white LED or uh, other companies, for example, add uh, a lime or an amber LED or a mint, for example, to full, uh, full in up the spectrum, to complete the spectrum a little bit more, um, then you gain a color rendering index above 90 for an LED luminaire that has been lacking of um, quality before very much. So then the luminaire changes into um, just an effect light into a functional lighting. So this is uh, one thing that is very important if you uh, consider light quality. Oh, that makes sense. And are, are you guys, a, you're a lighting manufacturer, you're a luminaire manufacturer, or are you actually doing the LED chips themselves? No, we do not do the chips ourselves. Um, our LEDs are bought with um, Nietzsche from Japan. Um, we have been customer of them uh, for 18 years now, so we are very well respected and we can pick uh, our binning ourselves and do not like get um, a huge binning, but a very small and uh, very precise binning. So the quality of the uh, LEDs that we uh, buy is very precise um, and very high, of course. Um, we do design all the boards. 
we do uh, manufacture the boards here, so all the pick and place will be ha uh, will be uh, will happen here. It's downstairs, um, and uh, all the assembly of the boards is here, and including the development and the software development, of course. So. Now, this might be a scientific question, and maybe I should know the answer, but um, you mentioned some different colors earlier and the types of chips that you can have. Can every color be done with red, green, and blue? Should I know this, Mike? <laughs> Is that what RGB does? Can everything, if you just mix and match? <laughs> let's let let's let Solva answer the question. I would okay. say yes. <laughs> but, um... This, well, it depends. In general, yes. Yeah. Um, you can see behind me uh, the gamut, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it is um, the gamut that you can see as the uh, visible spectrum. Um, the um, um, diagram is an idea of the uh, Institute of um, of the International Commission of Lighting, and um, for us. Us as a manufacturer, you can see a triangle in there and all the colors that are in this triangle can be reproduced by our LEDs or by our boards. Every manufacturer has a little bit of difference because you are not um, having LEDs that um, are at the very, very blue and at the very, very red edge of the uh, gamut. So, uh, there's always a triangle and depending on the manufacturer, whether they add an amber LED or something, it might be also a um, pentagon thing mm. or a, a um, I do not know the English word for a seven, uh, seven -tagon? <laughs> Septagon? I don't uh, know. I don't know either, uh, but you know what here, let me, <laughs> just for those listening, because most of the people will listen to this, what we're seeing in the background mm -hmm. is um, sort of a black graph with uh, uh, a green and blue and red uh, shading around it in the middle is white and there's a triangle there. And and uh, what what Solveig is describing is that they they expand further into the reaches of the color richness than other other. Um, LED manufacturers can for various reasons. Is that is that correct, Solveig? Is that a correct description of that diagram? Um, yes. So I, I want to talk to you about qu quality. So we, we often, um, you know, we, we dive into this a lot. I mean, uh, Tony Esposito is someone uh, here in, in America that, that does a lot of work in this in this realm. And he talks about vividness, fidelity, and preference as being the uh, various factors involved in light quality. But that it, because something is high fidelity doesn't mean it's preferred. And because something is very vivid, it doesn't mean it's preferred. So there's this balance between preference and other things like color um, uh, fidelity to color is, is not necessarily preferred by people. And so how do we, uh, do you guys get into the, the, that kind of side of it where you're looking at what people prefer versus what is uh, rendering something in uh, better or showing better color differences. What's more important to you with the aspect of quality? Is it vividness, fidelity, or preference? It's all of them. It's depending on the approach and the project of the customer. So we have been starting in the event industry. There, white light was not too uh, important. There was about effect, a nice pink, um, a very intense red or a very intense blue. So uh, these were the aims at that time. But during the last seven to 10 years, um, we had a bigger um, share in the market of architectural lighting. So permanent installs where um, the idea is completely different than to show lighting. So um, we have um, invented in our idea during the last years that you can switch the modes of a product so that it has a um, an idea, uh, uh, it has a programming as a standard that is for show lighting, but um, the user can also change the firmware or the programming into a different mode so that there is more vivacity. Vivid. Vividness, vividness, <laughs> vividness. Sure. Um, so, so the it is some of them want 
especially when it is in TV, they need um, only low power and very um, low luminosity things. And then they want to dim this very precise at that um, from zero to 20%, but some want um, very high luminosity and then the colors have to be very intense. So we manufacture our product most as a standard, but we listen to what the customers want. So um, this new feature is not released yet, but it's it's right over there in the technical <laughs> department. They, they work on it because the, the idea is there and it depends on the project. Sometimes it's just um, very small and uh, tiny nuances you need to achieve. Um, sometimes it's just uh, in your face, red, green, blue. And then the, the control thing is different or the uh, control of the luminaires is different. You know what's interesting, Greg, and and what I'm what I'm really seeing as a trend in lighting that is going to be unstoppable, in and what I think Schnick Schnack is really in this marketplace now, and where every you guys are already there, and and but you're what's co coming is like the the uh, collision of architectural and general lighting with theatrical lighting, and you're going to see that. Um, people, uh, buildings like hotel lobbies, like you mentioned, um, various event centers and all this are going to be able to want to set different scenes or different moods and they want to use the lighting system that they have. They don't want to bring in new lighting systems for an event. They want their existing lighting system in the hotel lobby to function um, for check-in at 11 a.m. and then party time at 11 p.m. And they want to be able to have those controls and program it to be able to set these these different kinds of moods. And they need to combine theatrical lighting with um, with their general lighting in order to be able to accomplish this without having to bring in all this extra equipment. And it, am I summarizing that correctly, Solvay? Do you think that's the right description of what's happening? A collision between architectural lighting and theatrical lighting? Absolutely. I think it's going that way with every or with nearly every architectural project that we uh, receive. There's always a uh, scenic, let's call it scenic part that where they can um, change uh, the environment just by lighting. Yes. And with the yeah. installed lighting. And, and this is very powerful. I mean, we, uh, Andrea Wilkerson at Pacific Northwest La National Laboratory was, was using tuning systems and, and just giving people the ability to tune their lighting systems. And they were looking for one thing, but they found that people ended up using these systems in, in, in different ways and using it to nudge people to do certain things. For, so, for example... Um, Greg, and you know, the people that listen to every show are going to get annoyed that I'm talking about this, but I think it's wonderful. They used it to nudge people to leave the hospital at visiting hours by lowering the color temperature slowly and dimming the lights. And this had the effect of, you know, people going, oh, geez, it must be getting late. The lights are being dimmed. Like in a theater, it's time to be quiet when the lights are being dimmed. In a hospital, when the lights are being dimmed, it's time to leave the hospital as a visitor. And so we're seeing this theatrical use of nudging or telling people something, communication is the words you use. I think nudging is a good word too, where we're nudging people to take a certain action using various amounts of light, various colors of light. We can cue people that it's party time, Solvig. We can cue people it's time to have a cocktail. Because using light, we can cue them that it's time to leave, we, you know, whatever. And so I, I think it's, it's interesting that your company is, is taking the software, the controls, the lighting from theatrical and moving into the general space. I think that is such a good idea. <laughs> I really do. I really think it's a good idea. Um, tell me who's in charge of the strategy uh, or tell me what, what the strategy is for moving into the arch architectural space. Most of the time, since we all have our bases in the entertainment industry, so I'm a sound technician originally. Um, Erhard, the owner of the company, he was a very light technician at his very young, young ages. Um, and a lot of people in here, so uh, Thomas, for example, has been working with MA as a freelance programmer. Um, so um, 
All of our ideas are based on the entertainment industry and broadcast studios. Most of the input uh, of the architectural market is coming from our customers. So they have the request and say, hey, we need something that is like this or it's working like this. Can you do it? Because we have little knowledge about the architectural uh, market and also when you consider or when you compare the project, when you are in the um, entertainment industry, all the things have to work the same way. So if big uh, render companies are renting strips from each other and luminaires from each other, it doesn't matter which company it is. But so if it is moving lights, for example, it's the same. They have to work all the same so you can mix and match them, especially with our strips. They are so tiny. Um, you would not have like serial numbers and after a big production like Eurovision Song Contest where there's 12,000 strips from all over the world, you would not figure like, okay, this is yours and this is mine. You would just split like this was 5,000 from you and this was 4,000 from me. Um, they have to work all the same. They have to have the same luminosity. But if you are in an architectural project, then everything is completely different because they want to have, for example, if the strips lose data or uh, the luminaires lose data, they have to turn black, for example, or if, um, which is important on cruise ships, for example. So they do not distract people to the wrong direction because on a cruise ship, if they lose um, data, this means something is going wrong on the cruise ship and you should not go on stage, you should go outside. So um, th then the, the product is the same product, but it has a different uh, programming. Um, and then it's uh, closed for this market or, or for this project, other projects where they need more luminosity or where they need, for example, a feedback in, in the product because they uh, want to um, have a reporting about everything is all right or in KNX installation or integration into a DALI environment where the facility manager is able to switch things on and you do not have the um, um, programmer for the content programmer on site all the time. So the, the basic knowledge is of the in, in, based in the in event industry, but the input, how to use our products is coming from the customers. So, so there was not really a strategy to focus on this market. We have no clue what they are doing. So now, as you're talking and as I'm thinking about this, this is a wild card thought, Mike, but that's why we're on the show. And I don't know if that's really a question out of this, but health effects of lighting has been talked about a lot in, in general lighting terms. Uh, you know, dimming and controllability mm. and all that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's something to the RGB. And what I mean by that is when I think about, um, you know, when lighting makes you feel good. Like, let's say you have a company and your logo is blue and you want it to be blue. And you walk in the door and your light is blue and on that logo and it looks good. Now you're happy. That's that's health, right? <laughs> I'm kind of asking Mike this. I mean, yeah. like, I'm looking at like that. Like, how does it make you feel? And RGB can definitely invoke a, a better feeling to all of your lighting in general. So should it be more um, released or more popular I, in the I'm general I'm going to jump in and I'm going to frame the question a little yeah. bit differently. I know what you're saying. So the people, you know, the health effects of lighting, okay, or circadian entrainment or these types of things, um, mo most of that knowledge is unknown right now. And they they don't understand really how the sun works and how to mimic that in interior environments. And I think in some ways it's a little bit silly to think that you know the the way that the sun affects us can be can be brought inside. I often talk about not doing damage with lighting as the starting point. But there's another part of wellness which I think is embedded in interior design, and rather than in into um, you know affecting your circadian rhythm rather it's in how you feel when you're in the space and different environments need different feelings and i believe that lighting is the absolute heart is at the heart of interior design and what you're saying i think what schnickschnack is doing greg is they are bringing in the ability to create more dynamic spaces so that you can create different kinds of moods 
that will make people feel good in different ways and at different times. Is that, Solveig, is that a kind of a, a, a good summary or am I missing something on that? I think you're quite right. We call it, we create digital colors for your uh, creativity. So mm. um, the architect and the lighting designer uh, gets something like a Lego box. So he can create shapes and sizes and what he wants to do. Also, um, the toolkit consists of various colors. So you can on also have only monochrome. Um, mm and RGB and RGBW uh, and maybe also very specific colors. So if you need a special wavelength, for example, that's that's possible with us. Um, if you have something like a very intense blue or something, so we can uh, buy an LED that is more, more specific uh, to your needs. But in general, yes, it's, it's depending mm. on the lighting designers um, ideas and then uh, if he and the architect most of the time um, there's now two players in the game one interior designer and the, uh, uh, a lighting designer who who are in charge of uh, creating a nice room or several nice rooms and also are um, in charge of maybe creating rooms that are changeable so that they have different uh, roles or uses in the same room and that's I think it's a hard task but there's during the past years there have been a lot of manufacturers that uh, deliver the right tools to create rooms like these. So what are the toughest colors and I'm going to chime in on one that I know about uh, there was one project I had where they wanted to get maroon light can you get the color maroon out of RGB LED? Maroon? What's what's uh, maroon is like a mixture of purple and red. Purple red, yeah. Yeah, you can get it. That you can okay, because I, I I heard one that, yeah. that they said that was... maroon was a was the toughest <laughs> one to get uh, from somebody. But what what is the toughest one to get? What is the toughest color? Well. Well, if you ask me, the picture I had in my back uh, at the very beginning, this one, um, it's an installation with um, dots that are hanging from the ceiling. Um, and one of the things I like about this project the most is that it has um, an, the possibility to have something like olive green mustard yellow, um, very pale uh, amber um, dots, and also very light lavender. Those, um, those colors that are usually uh, with a lot of white content or, or, or a lot of white in there that are very bright usually. So these colors are hard to mix and these look very uh, strange. If you do not um, follow some rules, for example, 16-bit dimming per channel or um, adjusted dimming curves and then uh, also the control side, so the video has to be adapted. I think that these colors are the most um, hard to achieve and these look really strange if you have the uh, some bad products or picked the wrong product for your application. So if you would go with red, green, and blue only, and your installation has red, green, and blue, so the corner of the a triangle. So that's very easy. But uh, if you go back to, <laughs> well, there you go. If you, if you have this area, these colors are really hard to get because the, the three components of red, green, and blue, they need to match very precisely there. Hmm. Now, the, uh, with these different color varieties, are you, um, how do you measure if a colored LED is of high quality? Is that, be, is that by the appearance to the eye? That you say that doesn't, you said like sometimes it can look strange. But, um, and I guess what you're saying is 
we didn't get the effect we wanted, right? Like that's what you're saying, <laughs> yeah. right? Is like it look it doesn't look that's not what I wanted to buy. I wanted to buy this this mm-hmm. white dot with a purple haze around it, which is what you were showing us mm-hmm. in the original. So for those listening, it's mm-hmm. like a it's like little balls of white light hanging from strings with a a purple haze around it, and that's what you were trying to achieve. And people can envision this in their heads, mm-hmm. but sometimes when you try to do it, you don't get that. And so what you're saying is that when you're trying to play closely with white and other colors, it becomes more and more difficult when you want to add sort of accents to white. That's where it's very difficult. Yeah, exactly. But deeper colors are easy. Um, deeper colors are yes. easy. Yes. Okay. De- deeper colors are very easy to achieve because the LEDs are sorted to or are manufactured to reprodu- uh, reproduce these colors. So the sum of the three components, red, green, and blue, these the, these are hard to get. And then there's one thing um, that makes it also a little bit difficult, but have you ever bought a furniture from a shop uh, where there was LED included? And mm-hmm. um, and then you get those remote controls where mm-hmm. there's uh, a, a ribbon ta- uh, a LED tape included, mm-hmm. and then you switch on and say, I want to have 1% or 2% on, just mm-hmm. dimmed, and it makes step, step right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then okay. <laughs> there's nothing like Romans and there's nothing like, uh, okay, now I don't want to have it that bright, but mm-hmm. there's nothing between zero and 10%. And then mm-hmm. if you uh, tune it up very much, it looks nice, but it's so bright um, that it is not uh, suitable for your environment or, or the idea you have had about the furniture. And if dimming happens like this, that it is a step, step on, you will not achieve the very beautiful and uh, sensible colors that are um, a mixture of red, green, and blue. How so, much of the, how um, much of this is software? Like, so you're you're what you're doing is you're addressing the you have a like instead of you know taking a, a a dimmer and lowering the voltage, say, which is how you dim incandescent, you just lower the you create more mm-hmm. resistance. And so in doing so incrementally, you dim from zero to 100 percent. So if you if you take you turn the dial or s- smooth the knob, the incandescent light will dim accordingly by percentage of resistance to the voltage. When you, what you're talking about is actually addressing individual parts of that color spectrum you showed us using software and technology to create different kinds of of light effects. And that, that, is that where the technology lies in addressing the individual chips in a way using software? Yes, it is. Well, the chips or the LEDs are able to, um, to store um, data for their own programming. Um, some manufacturers uh, have pre-programmed chips we mm-hmm. do not use pre-programmed. We use LEDs and have a special device on the strips to store them ourselves, to to uh, describe or to program themselves, and everything has the same data out of our company. But yes, uh, the programming in the control part is the very important one uh, because if you um, have 255 steps or 256 uh, with DMX uh, 8-bit dimming, then you would have only 256 steps. That's 0.4% of the whole intensity um, during dimming. So um, our eyes are used or are capable to see a 3% difference in luminosity. So if you decrease or increase the luminosity of a luminaire, by 3%, if you change it by 3%, our eyes are po- uh, able to see it. If you figure a dimming curve, this one is power linear. Um, if you use 8-bit dimming, uh, um, you would have a percentage average 0.4. It's a little bit less, but 0.4 to calculate. Um, if it would be 250 steps, it would be 0.4%. We have 256 steps. But if you turn on the luminosity for one step, 
that would be 0.4%. And then you take the second step, it would be 0.8%. This is an increase of luminosity by 100%. And our eyes and also the cameras receive this. Mm. So um, this makes um, that we figure this as a stepping. And um, one idea is, so if you go the next step, one, one more 0.4%, so to 1.2, it would be incre increased by 50% again. So mm -hmm. you also would see this. And then it makes at the very bottom here, at the very low area, you would see step, 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 and your eyes would see, oh, it's, mm. it's getting brighter and it's getting brighter. But if you are up there with 100% and then um, you turn down, you, you go to 99.6. This is 0.4% of change. You will not see it because the first step you would see is 97%. Mm -hmm. So, so that's fascinating. So it's not about the light level. It's about how much more light is produced. And that's what yes. you notice. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and have you solved this problem at the low end where you're able to remove the human conscious eye's ability to see the step the, the steps of the dimming? Yes, the yellow curve is ours and the green curve is ours. Um, blue is sRGB, so um, this is not our standard, but it's to compare this one. And DALI, for example, the architectural protocol of lighting control, they have done an even more flat dimming curve, as you can see, because they do, usually they do generic lighting, general lighting. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's not important to have very, um, um, for them, it's important to adapt during the time of turning on the light. So you switch the switch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you turn on the light and then the light goes whoop on but your eyes are able to follow this line and your eyes are able to adapt and it's not like boom in your face like in the airplanes like, mm. yes, um, so, so therefore dali for example has a very flat dimming curve um, the three that you can find here are especially for um, rgb color mixing for example because these are a compromise of dimming in the very uh, low area, but also to have a good relationship between um, three colors. So if you, um, it's hard to explain, um, if you dim three colors in total and you have a mixture of um, three colors that are not at the same level, but Red is, for example, at 70% and green is only at 20%, um, then you would have a uh, yellowish red. But mm. if you would turn it on and off, um, the, the green would dim slower and the red would dim more intensely. So you would have a color shift and the color would not dim uh, the same color, but the value of the color uh, and the appearance of the color would uh, would change during the general uh, general dimming. So during the master dimming. So these two uh, three curves here are um, a compromise of color mixing and a good mixing beha uh, dimming behavior at the bottom. You guys are a technology company. You're not a lighting company. Like that's tech that what you're talking about yeah. is um, you're talking about uh, uh, communication, like technology of software and microchips and 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 that you're like a like a tech company that that yeah. that does lighting. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> this idea that it's interesting because, Greg, what she what she's saying is that the dimming controls on RGB systems create all kinds of weird colors if they're not mm -hmm. calibrated properly. 
And I've seen it with my own eyes. Like you get these barf yeah. greens and these weird, like you go to dim them, it's like <laughs> barf color for a bit or whatever, and it doesn't dim right. And, you know, it's interesting that, that there's a, that, that the solution to that is addressable LED chips that are programmed to, to change the, the dynamism of their dimming according so that the, the color as it dims stays as true as possible. That's actually really cool <laughs> that you it guys is. have have come up with that. Uh, <clears throat> we're coming up there's, on 40. There's, yeah, not only, there's not only our approach of that. I mean, there's other companies that, um, for example, change the diagram of their, um, um, of their visible colors, the, the colors that they can achieve. Um, and also 16-bit um, dimming per channel is not a secret anymore. So um, it's kind of state of the art right now so this increases the dimming um behavior as well um and this is often used in in different companies so going back to the this is a very uh serious and important question at the beginning you said your favorite color is pink does it have anything to do with the work you're doing or you just like the color pink well <laughs> um i just like the the color pink it's, it's beautiful isn't it you and know what that's it, great that's greg's uh, favorite color too <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice color i didn't know if it had to do with the lighting that it was hard to get but no it's good so, so no, like, i there... mean pink drinks cosmopolitan sure. is very nice to drink yeah. and pink now you're champagne talking. Now you're so... talking. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Um, any any final uh, thoughts for the Get a Grip on Lighting listeners, Solvay? I would recommend it's not only um, or, or it's not always about um, cheap or expensive. It's think about the project. So, what is the aim of 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 the installation, what do you intend to do? Does it have to be long lasting? Does it have to be for just two weeks and then the project is done? Um, what is your idea about um, how the project or how the result uh, shall be? So there's nothing like um, right or wrong um, because there's so many different uh, ideas to achieve a good lighting result. So you, I, I would recommend you always ask a little bit and uh, read into the topic. And there are many manufacturers that answer questions very um, precisely because companies like ours, yes, you said, right, we are a technical company. And if uh, I ask Erhard about anything technical, he would explain it to me on to the bottom of all knowledge that you can achieve or uh, that you can find physically so uh if you have questions about it don't hesitate to ask anybody well there you go this uh this color thing this 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 collision between architectural greg and um theatrical lighting i should probably still be back here this camera should be here greg before we go we got to talk about hanging all this stuff with griplocksystems.com. That's G R I P L O C K S Y S T E M S dot com, Greg. Grip it up. That's right. Toolless adjustability, that's important so that you can get it level where you need it. They also have safety and quality control on, on all of it. They, they test every single shipment they do, every part in their warehouse is making sure that they don't have any issues down the road when you are hanging the lights. So they play it safe, they get you the right stuff. They make it easy. And I'm telling you from experience, it's the only way I hang light fixtures is with grip lock systems. And of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, our patrons, look, this, this association is on fire, buddy. We're, we're rocking and rolling. We got all sorts of stuff going on. If you want to be a part of us, you got to join us. You want to be a part of the, the action, get in on the action at naald.org. And of course, special thanks to Schnick, Schnick Schnack Systems. That's schnicksnacksystems.com. S C H N I C K S C H N A C K S Y S T E T E M S dot com. Solveig Bustler, thank you for joining us today. And uh, what a conversation! What an interesting time to be alive when all these technologies we're starting to learn how to use them. And and I think it's wonderful. But for you, the listeners, we love you guys and gals out there. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>